Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. You've tuned into this week's episode of Lifestyle Pirates with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. Howdy. This week we're joined by performer and entertainer, Julian Kuo. Hey, good morning, how are you? G'day guys, how are you? Very well. Very Fantastic. Well. That's good. Um, how have the last few months been? How have you been? You're, you're back kind of front and centre on stage, but take us through, well, the last few months. Uh, I guess they've been a bit crazy for everyone, so... Mm. Um, it's not, not new news there, but um, we were shut down at the show on the 25th of June. Yep. And uh, we had, I think, almost four and a half months off. I think we came back to work kind of towards the end of October. Yep. For rehearsals. And then we got back on stage about five weeks ago. So it's been sort of a, a very quick pickup back to like a full grind. Mm, we do yeah. eight shows a week. So it went from zero to hero. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, in five seconds. So entertainment was the first thing to go and the last thing to come back. Yeah, generally. I mean, it, it's it's generally tends to be hospitality and entertainment and service industries where you've got like a lot of people in the same space that took a long time to come mm. back. Um, and especially obviously indoor work. So like sporting arenas, obviously, they brought back sooner because you could be outside. Um, but it took us a while to kind of get back to a point where people also were willing to kind of come out. Mm. Because obviously like, you know, we've got two and a, two and a bit thousand people in, in the room. Mm. So for people to kind of feel comfortable with being in yeah. that space with that many people... That takes some time. Yeah, I bet it does. So what does an entertainer do when there's no entertainment available? <laughs> we hustle. Yeah. We hustle and we <laughs> hustle and we hustle. Um, the, look, the thing about entertaining, I guess, and, and the entertainment industry in general is that we're kind of all very used to not having a regular job. Mm. So for us, like a regular job is sort of the, the nice calm period where we can kind of just do what we do and not think about everything else. Um, but for me personally, I also do a lot of teaching. So I kind of fell back on that. I did a lot of online kind of vocal teaching and coaching. And then um, just sort of actually invest time in the work that we were doing currently. I mean, we were lucky. We were really supported through government payments, but also through the company. Um, and they gave us a lot of support financially. So we could kind of dig into the material. We could kind of go further into character. We could go further into the music. We could really invest our time in the work, mm. which actually when you're ironically doing a show – you don't always have the time to do that sort of analytical stuff. You don't have time to always sit down and do it because you're, you're on stage or you're rehearsing something else. You're trying to do the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Yeah, yeah. So having the time to actually really slow and do really detailed work mm. was actually kind of like, it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise, yeah. despite the fact that it was a grind of going, we don't know when, yeah. how, even if we're actually coming back. So that was the kind of, the stressful part was just kind of going, does this return or not? But we were, we had every hope and every confidence that it would. How is the vibe now? Is it is it like electrified or multiplied now that it, you know entertainment has come back and you're like we we finally can do what we love doing again? Is it different now? I think we're all really 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 grateful to be back at work. I mean it, it's it's an odd thing. Like I guess it's the same for everyone. We didn't we never expected to be told that basically our profession was illegal for mm. eighteen months. We couldn't we literally couldn't do what we do. Um, and a lot of us in the entertainment industry, especially actors or performers or directors or people who are, you know, really into creative work, we're really driven by our careers and by our profession. So when you're not allowed to do what you do, there's often kind of a bit of an identity crisis that kind of comes from that. Yeah. So for us, being back at work is just a nice kind of calming influence to say, we're back, we don't have to prove anything anymore, we can, we can just do it mm -hmm. and enjoy it and be grateful to be back. Um, and not necessarily always give in as well to the kind of stresses and the the kind of garbage that we add to the work, the stresses that we add to the work, mm. because we're just happy to be back. Mm. Did you find that um, some people sort of question their industry because it's so quickly to be able to be taken away? So there must have been people saying like, oh, do I want to be in this industry where they can just take away everything I, I am? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean... You mentioned identity crisis. It's like taking away your identity, really. Yeah, I, I think we all... <laughs> We all question this game all the time because, like, it's such, it's such a risk. Mm. You know, like, rocking up to work if you've got a, if you've got a normal, uh, I'll put in brackets, a, a traditional career, mm -hmm. a nine to five, a nine yeah. to five. Yeah. Um, we sometimes call them muggles. <laughs> Probably a bit of a dickhead <laughs> way to talk about that. it, but <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you have a traditional career where you know you go to work, you go to your office, you get a salary, you get all the benefits of that, you know, there's a lot of security in that. Whereas for us. We don't, you know, we go from gig to gig to job to job to job to job. And at the end of the day, you can only pay your bills if you're in work at that time. So how people choose to do that is different. You know, I teach, I 
do a lot of kind of band work and sort of independent work as well. But we're always kind of looking over our shoulder going, okay, is this, is what I do worth the sacrifices that come with it? You know, we kind of sometimes always, we can't always afford to buy a house. We can't always afford to buy a car or to, you know, feel comfortable enough or, or secure enough to do the traditional kind of life steps. Mm. And so sometimes we feel like th th those structures are, are so morphed that I think we're always questioning whether or not it's what we actually really kind of want. And I think the one thing that COVID has done for a lot of our industry is it's either solidified that we want to do it or it's pushed people completely away from it, yeah. left to centre, because it's – you, you had to really want to stick in it, <laughs> to stick in it over the last little while. Yeah, definitely. And, and how about you? How have you come out? I've come out, I've come out with a kind of a, a similar outlook as I went in, I think, that, I mean, I have a lot of hobbies and a lot of interests and a lot of things that I enjoy outside of my work. And that's always what's kept me sane during those down periods. And, like, I have things to, to enjoy. I, have, I, don't, I don't like considering myself only what I do. Mm. Um, and I have a lot of different people in my life from different hobbies and, and different sort of like different jobs and on and off that I've done. And so I never felt completely isolated or kind of uh, separated from, from life or from reality when I, when I was in isolation. I sort of just kept doing the things that I'd done for a long time. And, um, and I haven't actually at, at the end of the day done a lot of long-term commercial projects. I've always done sort of like short one month, two month gigs. Mm. And then, you know, the corporate and band work that I do and then teaching. So actually for the first lockdown, my life wasn't particularly affected. I just wasn't performing. I was just teaching. I was just doing the one side of my, my normal job. Mm. This time has been different because I got really used to being on stage for three months or working in one thing for three or four months and then it got shut down. Yeah. So that was a really different kind of slightly more jarring experience this year. Mm. But overall, no, it, it's, it's definitely made me go, I, 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 this, is, this is what I want to do. Mm. Um, and it's, it's just sort of made me focus in on exactly what I want from it instead of yeah. feeling quite as generalised, I think. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So, so how did you get into this? Because you've been doing this since you were 11. Yeah. Uh, or you've been, <laughs> you've been a performer since you were 11. We had, um, we had a movement director mm -hmm. on last, in, the, in the last show and um, yeah, she was saying her family, it was very, very evident her family saw that she was going to be on stage. Like, right. uh, what was your kind of journey into this space? Um, my, my family have always loved music. Yep. So I grew up around music a lot. Um, my grandmother and my mother especially both absolutely love jazz and swing and that sort of era, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis. Um, and so I got interested in music through them and then when I was about 11, I stumbled into opera. Um, and so I sang with Australian opera for about four or five years doing children's chorus work and a couple of juvenile principal roles, so Magic Flute, I was first boy. And I sort of just got addicted to that from that age um, and I, I studied it from then onwards. And I, I don't know, I just sort of never really considered properly anything else. I kind of dabbled in other thoughts and I was like, maybe I should do something different. Yeah. <laughs> and every time I kind of like got right to the point of going, no, I'm going to, I'm going to commit and leave something else from this side of my life pulled me back in. And yeah. So it kind of by about 23, 24, I was like, no, that's, <laughs> this is telling me, everything's telling me that just, uh, just to keep going on this and something will, something will work out. So what, would, uh, what was your inspiration for getting into it? Do you, is there an inspiration for what you do? I think it just comes from the love of the, the work itself mm. and the love of, of music and of, of storytelling in general. Um, I think the really important thing that, that comes from jazz and from swing and from that era of music, the kind of great American songbook, uh, Cole Porter, George Gershwin, all those kind of guys, um, is that everything is focused around a lyric and around storytelling and around personal experience and about the human condition and all these sort of trigger words. Mm. Um, but they're, they're real. And I think that the more comfortable we feel telling those sort of stories and being open to them, the more we experience from life itself. So I think it, there's this sort of, there's this real addiction that comes from, from saying these things and being open and, and wanting to communicate them and then add to that the feeling of being on stage and the feeling of of lights and community and all this sort of thing. It all kind of combines into one. But I think if you're talking about a, a sole inspiration, it's that I love, I love talking, I love telling stories, I love sharing experiences, I love sharing those things with other people. And I think performing um, of all the arts allows you to do that in a community and with other human beings. Mm. 
Whereas, you know, if you're an art, if you're a, a painter, which my, my father's a painter, it's a much more private artistic experience. You say things and people might might buy that and take that home with them, but you're not communicating with them looking at their looking into their eyes mm. or, or touching them physically. So it's a different artistic experience. Writing would be the same thing. I can write and I can express story, but I can't see that person's reaction mm. when they read my book. Yeah. Whereas on stage or or when you're performing with someone or for an audience member, you get that experience mm. kind of really tangibly, eye to eye, mm. face to face. Um, and that's that's a real... Uh, the, the first time you kind of really get into it, it's a real drug. You start going, oh, I want this connection all the time. I want this this feeling of of interaction all the time. Mm. Almost sounds like the original kind of Facebook without Facebook, really, that kind of instant gratification, you can see them. I've never thought of it that way in terms of an author. They release a book or a painter does a picture mm. and they never get the feedback from from the people that buy that. I've never thought of it that way. I mean, all. look... That's really interesting. You might get it from the fact that that person has purchased your work, right? So you, yes. So they must connect to it somehow. Yeah. But there's something about looking in someone's eye and being able to be someone completely different or, you know, to look at someone and go, you know, you're my my mate outside of work, but on stage right now, I want to kill you. Mm. And that difference in human emotion and feeling those different things and the ability to empathise or to connect with people who live completely different experiences and completely different lives to you is very exhilarating. And that's why you have a lot of, you know, you talk to actors or you, you hear actors being interviewed all the time, they go, I, I want the, the, the evil role. I want the things that are so different to me because that makes me challenge my own perspective of myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're on stage, you're not actually following a certain s- set of steps that you have played out in your mind. You, you actually are that character. <sighs> that's, a, that's a complicated question, right? Because there's a fine line between doing the show, mm. which are, you know, the choreography, the blocking, which is, you know, where you stand, who you look at, what arm you lift sometimes. It can be very, very specific. Hitting your mark so that the spotlight that's angled at that exact spot on stage hits you. Mm. And then being, as you said, in character or being being the person, right? You have to do both things. One is stagecraft. One is the technical aspect of going, I need to walk here, then here, then here, meet this person, shake that person's hand, then exit stage left. Mm. The other part is once you know that, having confidence in yourself that that's going to happen automatically and then to tell the story. Yeah. So it's a layered, it's a layered experience and the, the real difficulty and the real art form of it is to take something that you've been told to do and make it feel like it's happening organically and naturally and inspired by the person you're playing rather than reaching your marks. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really weird thing to try and explain to people because you go... Yeah, that's a it's a totally valid question to say. So hold on, are you acting? Like, are you are you being that person, or are you just kind of doing exactly what you've been told to do? Mm. And it's it's the, the real answer is it's a combination of both. You have to do what you're told to do because there's everything that's going on around you that you're completely not in control of. Mm. But then you also have to inhabit who you are. You have to inhabit that character to make that effective and affecting for an audience who's watching you. Mm. It's a balancing act. And do you put your own sort of persona into the character as well? Again, that depends on the show and the amount of leeway that you're given by yeah. the creative team or by the director. Yeah. Um, some shows you're allowed to do literally whatever you want. You're allowed to bring everything of your own to this person. Other times there's a, uh, there's a, a character who is that character and you must be that person. That's who you're playing. Which is more fun to do. Oh, bringing yourself in is always more fun. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because you can play the different aspects of your character or lean into them without necessarily completely exposing yourself if that makes sense you, you can go i love this side of me or I hate this side of me and i'm going to bring that out and play with that and experience if i genuinely do hate it or if it's something that i just haven't explored enough in my own personality um things like strength aggression or power all these sort of negative things that we think about sometimes we, we completely shy away from them when we actually need to just get a little bit of them in our lives to kind of balance out the, the understanding and the, and the softer side of our lives. Mm. So I find it really interesting to play with dynamic, to go, do I need more of that in my life? Do I need less of that in my life? How do I balance that out and take that away from the work that I do um, and also say something mm. as a character? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> my mind's getting blown right now. <laughs> how do you <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. How do you, how do you switch off? 
Oh, that look. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Every everyone has their own ways of switching yeah. off. Like I, there's, and I think this is something that the industry itself is starting to finally actually talk about tangibly. Um, we we've had a lot of a lot of things. You know, in in Hamilton, which I'm doing at the moment. There's there's a lot of there's death. There is um, there's sexual violence. There is um, there's all these 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 sort of really heavy topics. Mm. And there are nights when you come to work and you're completely discon- The reality is you're completely disconnected and you don't you don't necessarily connect with everything because there's something that's happened in your day that you've been like, oh, I'm just obsessed with that now, so I can't focus on what I'm doing. Mm. There are other nights when you're so in it that you're watching what's happening on stage and reality completely disappears and what reality is is what's happening in front of you. Oh, that must be amazing. It's it's amazing, but it's also really, really, really difficult mm. to then leave that space. Mm and leave the shit that you've dealt with on that stage on that stage. And so that's why I think that it's affected so many people in the industry, generally speaking, mental health, because, you know, I said before, right, the way that you look at someone on stage is different to where you look at them in real life. Mm. Someone might have, my, I, might, I might absolutely hate someone on stage, mm. like off stage, mm. but they might have to be my lover on. Mm. Mm. And so that sense of who people are and people's identity kind of gets completely blurred as yeah. soon as you step on. And so to step off, you have to just sort of take a breath, reconnect. And the way that I do it personally is I fall back on the, the other things that I love. So I, you know, I really like fashion. I really like, I love English football. Um, Thank you for calling it football. No problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Someone called it soccer the other day and I was like, ah, <laughs> leave, leave yeah. my space. Um, you know, I have all these sort of hobbies that I enjoy. I enjoy food, like these sort of... And so what I like to do is remove myself from that space and go and, and go and do something towards that if I'm having a day where I feel overly connected to the work or overly emotionally affected by the work. Other people have different techniques. Some people will, you know, go home and meditate for a period of time. Some people will um, do something physical, something tangible, like, a, I don't know, they'll do a, a sauna or they'll do... They'll go for a run or... There's lots of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's really important that, that people start to, to take that element of the industry more seriously going forward because it, it really does affect people quite quite heavily because of the work. Mm. I think we've seen that as well with people working from home, mm-hmm. again, in, in their nine to five, which is, again, has become totally blurred where people working seven to seven, seven to eight, they're, you know, they're, they're rolling out of their bed, not even really getting dressed. They just crack on with work. And so mm-hmm. it does blur that. You know, your home is now your office, was now your gym, is now your you know you know therapy session you know it's it, it, it's everything. Th- there's nowhere to switch off now. And people, I think, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and there was people talking about their commute. And some people were actually saying, "I really look forward to getting my commute back because it was my preparation up for the day and my come down after the day." And I would listen some tunes, or I'd listen to a podcast, or I'd read a book on the train. And they they've lost that, totally. and therefore they're just engaged and exhausted. Mm. I mean, rules on. it's interesting, right? Because that's that experience of life where your job is your is your bubble, is your life. Mm. It's kind of what we go through all the time. Mm. In that, my my job never stops. I never really completely switch off. I do a lot of my my preparation from home. I'll do I'll learn material from home, you know, and a lot of a lot of the times a performer or an entertainer's social life is our work because at the end of the day, when we work you're playing. Mm. You know, I go to work when pe- when when the general when when most people are having lunch on the weekend or are going out for a drink on Saturday night, we're at work. Mm. So it it means that it, it can feel quite isolationist in that sense. Mm. Like, you know, the people that we see at those sort of normal times that people are going out for dinner with their partner mm. are when I'm at work with my colleagues. Mm. And so there's this real kind of confusion sometimes of blurring the lines between work and 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 life um so it's an interesting it's interesting hearing you speak about about a you know a working from home situation and that confusion coming mm-hmm. into to a lot of people is it does that mean it's hard um from a relationship standpoint as well it's hard from a general relationship standpoint with anyone friends family partner outside of work because y- your times are just completely yeah. different yeah um so you have to you have to really make a concerted effort to to maintain those relationships in yeah. those situations yeah um, you mentioned that you're in Hamilton, mm-hmm. um, which I think is, you know, I think it's broken every <laughs> record that, I, that, a, that a, a show and a production can break. Um, walk me through how that came about. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We, I remember finding out it was coming uh, probably sort of like in the middle of 2019. I probably found out that it was coming here. Um, and so I got an audition for it. I did a couple of rounds of those audition processes in person. The final round that I did in person, I remember, was in Melbourne in February of 2020, right before kind of lockdown properly hit. Yeah. And then the final rounds of the audition process were all via Zoom and via self-tape. So we had to film ourselves doing the material and then send that in to people. Um, and then I found out that I booked the job sort of late 2020 and then we started this year. And so how does that process work? Because I see on your website you've got a manager. Mm -hmm. So do they, do they go, hey, Julian, w w this is coming in. Um, we suggest you audition for it. Do you approach them and say, like, what, what's the steps? That completely depends on the gig. So sometimes th the reality is this industry is very, very small. So mm. especially musical theatre, it's a tiny little group in terms of the, the, the people who are in it. You're in it. Yeah. And so you know people who are in it yeah. and you hear things on the grapevine a lot of the time, a long time before people know yeah. it's coming. So like the worst industry. kept secrets. Oh, this, they're <laughs> awfully kept secrets. <laughs> and you'll hear a rumour and you'll call your agent and you'll go, hey, yeah. I've heard this is coming. Yeah. Keep an eye on it for me. Yeah. Or you have something that just pops up out of nowhere because there happened to be an availability at a theatre. And so then your agent will reach out going, hey, this is coming, here's the audition. Um, either way, basically the system works that your agent will just will talk to the casting agent yep. and um, or submit you for an audition and then you either get accepted or denied for that audition. So you either get told, no, you're not right for the show so we're not going to see you or they say, yeah, come on in. And then you prepare material. So it might be your own choices of material or it might be something that the casting director has given you to prepare. Right. You go in, you do that audition. And then, again, it depends on the show how many rounds of auditions you have. So you might have three or four rounds. You might have two rounds. You might do one audition and book the job. It completely depends on the people involved within that production company and yeah. with, within that casting company and that, and that show. Yeah. So how long does it usually take, that, that bracket? <laughs> Time-wise, the casting process is kind of fluctuates anywhere between sort of two and six months normally. Mm. The Hamilton casting process was a lot. I think it took us almost I, – I, I did my first round in like September. My, my process for Hamilton was probably almost 12 months. Wow. wow. But I think that was probably Surely also – that's stressful. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, hard, the hard part is yeah, – Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> The, the hard part is going in, doing the job, doing the audition, and then going, I now can't afford in my life to think about what I just did. Mm. Because if I leave that audition room and think about how I performed in that, anywhere between five minutes and half an hour in that audition room, I'm just going to do nothing else. I'm just going to sit there going, did I get that? Did I get that? Yeah. And you start analysing everything within each of its life. You know, you start going, did I raise my hand at a bad time? Yeah. Oh my God. Did, that look, did that look really wrong? Did I sing flat? Was that was that note flat, or was that out of was that out of time? I don't know. And so you have to kind of I've I've learned now for myself that I have to go into an audition room, leave the audition room, and then just forget about it, yeah. or at least do my best and just not think about it again, until I get that call from my agent saying, "Hey, you got a call back." Yeah. And then you go, "Great, think about it again, think about yeah. it again," <laughs> until the next time happens. Yeah. Um, and that means that it doesn't start, start completely consuming your life. Otherwise, all you literally all you end up thinking about mm. is if you got that or not. And the reality is probably you find out a yes whenever, you, obviously, if you get it, mm. but you don't always find out a no. So sometimes they just don't contact you. Yeah. We'll call um, you. They don't call. They don't call. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you don't find out, there's this sort of like... That sounded traumatic thing. for you there, buddy. <laughs> they, they don't call. Yeah. They never they call. They never call. <laughs> they never call. <laughs> is there a bit of guilt there as yeah, well? Yeah, there <laughs> so, much, so much built in right now. <laughs> um, that but that yeah. must be hard to let go if you don't know as well, like if you don't get the call. Look, generally speaking, if I haven't heard within like two or three weeks, I'm like, oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. Or I haven't heard anything... The hard one is when like you go in for audition and all of a sudden the next two weeks come and there's a cast announcement. You're like, oh, I definitely didn't get that because yeah. they got that. Oh, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's not me. <laughs> that's not me. Would you be auditioning for multiple things? Mm. Or Again, that depends. In Australia, there's generally like an, what we call an audition season where like there's sort of normally two or three months of the year where you have all of the major commercial musical theatre auditions at once. Yeah. Because the programming is generally done like kind of annually. So you kind of know what big shows are coming in the next year because 
you've only got a certain number of theatres in each city. Yeah. yeah. So there can't be this sort of endless number of shows. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not, not like Broadway. It's not Broadway, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, yeah. Not like Broadway, the West End, where you've got so many theatres and the turnover can be, you know, six months, five years. I mean, something like Wicked has been running in Broadway since 2003. Yeah. Oh, I mean, how... Oh, with, the same, with the same cast? Oh, no, the, the cast obviously Fuck changes and shifts, but there's always someone who's... Yeah. I mean, there's one, one of the guys... Uh, I think there's one original cast member still on Broadway for Hamilton, and that's been on since 2015. That's a lot of shows. That's a lot of shows. Yeah. You're doing eight shows a week. You know, you you it's a lot of shows. Wow. I think Chicago's been on Broadway now this consistent production for twenty five years. So you know, on those in those sort of companies, you you can work for a, a mm. long period of time. Whereas here, generally speaking, most commercial shows will run for anywhere between sort of like six, like three to nine months in one place. If you go for longer than that, you you're in a really great position and you're very, very lucky and they don't come along very often. So you can kind of know what's coming in the, in the future, but that audition period happens. And, you know, a lot of the times, this is what's happened to me for, you know, a lot of my career until I kind of had, I started, I started booking things and kind of getting a bit of a, a bit of momentum up mm. in about 2019. But a lot of times you'll go into that audition season, you won't book something and you go, okay, great. Well, that means I'm not doing that this year. Mm. This coming year, I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be doing my gigs. Yeah. I'm doing my, my, my hustle. And then the season comes up again. And you go, let's see what happens. Cross fingers. Yeah. Whatever happens, happens. You go in. You don't get anything again. You go, great. Same thing next year. Yeah. And then you get lucky. <laughs> and something like this comes along and I go, wow, I I can look ahead to this year and know what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's luck. Have though. no doubts. It's it's 50-50 luck and work. Yeah. I think there's there's, you know... I'm I'm not going to in any way, shape, or form saying that it's complete luck, but there is there is an element of of that because I'm not in control of what shows are coming here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So right. I have to basically go. You know, if the show comes that's suitable for me, and then I then I have to go. Okay, great. I know I can do this. Mm. I know this fits my skill set. I know this fits who I am. I know this fits a lot of these different things. Now I'm in control. Now I have to do the best the best job that I can possibly do in that audition room to make that casting agent, make that producer, make that director believe in my ability. Mm. And then when I get the job, I have to back that up. Yeah. Right? So it's like this constant thing after getting it. But there is an element of luck that comes from it that goes, you happen to be in the right place at the right time, available, mm. tick boxes. You'd get that with your gigs as well. Yeah. So but they're never cool. <laughs> they, just, they never cool. Wow, um, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of bills. We'll get into that after, <laughs> off mic. Um, so eight shows a week. So sometimes you hear about people saying, oh, that was the best show I've ever done. Like, do they mm. vary? Like, what makes a show, if you're doing two a day, what makes one show better than the other? Is, is it that everyone's on, on point? Like, or is it just something that you feel yourself? Well, that depends on the person and wh the way they talk about those sort of things. A, a best show ever or a really great show is a show where you go on and generally speaking, you know, there are limited mistakes that you make mm. for me. Everyone would make mistakes. Uh, you, yeah. I mean, look, the magic of live theatre and the magic of doing things in person is the fact that you know you only get one shot at it mm. on that on that day. Mm. And there's always a moment when you go on stage where you're like, oh, do they, do they know this? <laughs> I, do I? Do you ever get that? Just like brain oh, freeze. I had it the other day and I was on stage and I was about to sing this song and I'm sitting down and I have to stand up and I have to make this little toast. And I was sitting down and I was going, oh God, I don't remember what this lyric is. <laughs> I, I do, I, for the life of me, I have no idea what I'm about to say. I just, I just don't know what I'm about to say. I don't know what this word is. And I was listening to the others on stage saying their lines and I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Oh Jesus God. Christ, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And I was like, just breathe, trust yourself. And as I stood up, my mouth just opened and I started saying the words. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You were just a passenger. <laughs> oh, you're the you're passenger. Yeah, because, because you're, You've done it so, you've rehearsed it so much yeah. that your body does things sometimes yeah. without you thinking about them. Yeah. And as soon as you start thinking about them, that's when you make mistakes. <laughs> that's when it goes to shit because yeah. you, you start second guessing everything that your body knows. Mm. And so your hand starts doing this and you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to trust. Yeah. Like, and you know, there are times when it won't come out. Mm. So no, a good show, long story short, is basically when you feel like you're, you're in control, you feel like you're calm, you feel like you're emotionally connected, and you feel like you've delivered the best performance that you think you can deliver. That's yeah. for me what it is. It's emotionally connected to the character or to the audience? 
The connections always should be to the people on stage with you. Okay. Because if if I connect genuinely with you, mm. then the person who's watching is going to believe that I'm yeah. genuinely in it and they're going to enjoy it. They're going to be emotionally connected to the action. Yeah. If I'm trying to get a reaction from my audience, they, you know, like it's, it's like in any personal relationship or any, any interaction with people, if someone looks you in the eye and is connected to you and is focused in this conversation, mm. you feel generally connected. You mm. feel generally that, that you're valued and you feel like you're being listened to. Mm. If I'm disconnected from that person on stage with me and I'm more concerned about what their reaction is going to be, they're not going to believe what I'm doing. So they're not going to have the reaction that mm. I want them to have. They're not going to have the experience that I want them to experience. Yes. So no, the connection side of things is always 100% to my fellow, my fellow performer, my fellow actor on stage. Yeah. Always. Do you, do you feel that the audience is there or when you get on, you're just, you're there to do your craft? It's not about the audience. You don't really recognize them there. Again, that, de- that depends on the, it, it's so hard because th- these questions all depend on the day. Oh yeah. There, there are moments where you'll walk on stage and you'll be like, I, like, I'm so exhausted and I'm so mentally and physically drained that if you don't clap today, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see the fact that I'm working my ass yeah, off on I'm this stage for you, <laughs> I'm going to, sh- oh. <laughs> like you start, you start getting a bit frustrated. But if you remind yourself in those situations that actually what their reaction is is not your concern mm. and that's not your job. Your job is to deliver this this beautiful piece of work honestly and accurately. Then you can deliver a really great show regardless of how you feel. And, you know, there's there's this great thing that someone said in, in this job. Um, they said, you know, you can make mistakes. You can miss a lighting cue. You can miss a lyric. It's a two and a half hour show at the end of the day that audience will still applaud because mm-hmm. they're not going to remember the little things. They're not going to notice the little things. They're not going to remember the little things. They're not, it's not going to bother them. We need to strive for as, as the best performance that we can get, yeah. but don't let those little mistakes or those little issues affect you too much because at the end of the day, the work is so great that the work is what will do the job for you. Mm. Trust the words, trust the action, trust the design, trust all the things that make this into a show mm. and trust the people on stage with you and it doesn't matter if you make a little mistake or not, you will, you will get through it. Mm. So, so on that, what makes, um, well, first of all, what part do you play in Hamilton? Mm-hmm. I'm a swing. So a swing, it basically is You got one of those in there, right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's our rumour start, buddy. <laughs> mate, a lot of cameras set up here. <laughs> mate, the things that I didn't think I would hear on this situation. Um, no, I'm a swing. So basically a swing is, is a musical theatre kind of term for, for a type of understudy. So I'm off stage the majority of the time. Mm-hmm. And then when one of the four people who my cover goes off, I go on stage. So I do four different roles in the show. Oh, wow. Um, and what I play that night depends on who's on or who's off. If I'm off stage, I'll sit backstage doing work or you know, working on, on personal projects and doing my own thing. Or we'll have like a scheduled rehearsal under the show with the other swings and the other understudies. Or I'll be on stage because someone's called out sick, someone's on annual leave, all those sort of things. So it just depends on the day, which is what actually I love most of all about this job now because I, I get to play four different things. It's yeah. always something different. So you've got to learn so four got, yeah. different... Yeah. That's That's a lot. I just heard way more work. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're a gonna, lot of work. Yeah, you've got to, you've yeah. got to learn. You've got to know four different... Yeah. Role. Fuck, man. I'm struggling <laughs> with my own self. Yeah. So we have... Well, the, the, I can imagine then there's four... This, you, well, you're doing you're, you're doing four people's jobs because then you got to remember the the cues. You got to remember, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, that's in Corey. So the cues, the direction, the character work, the melody, like your solo lines, your harmony parts, your Corey, everything you have to remember. Your traffic. So your traffic is basically like I walk there, you walk there, you cross behind me. I make sure I need to fall in behind you, otherwise I don't get to yeah, the line. Yeah, that would time. be so confusing. Yeah, and so basically, yeah. you know, we learn. For, I mean, all the swings in this show cover, or the, the understudies and the offstage cast cover between anywhere between three and six different roles. And there's 50... Does, does that mean they get six salaries? Yeah, that's an awesome... Well, no, <laughs> no, it awesome. doesn't. But if you imagine it this way, um, there are 52 individual pieces of music in this show. Mm. So Which, 52. again, that set a record as well, didn't it? Uh, I'm not sure if it's a record, or but it's it's a that's a large amount of music. I mean, Hamilton's sung through, so it's more yeah. like an opera than a traditional musical. There's no dialogue yeah. in it per se; it's all sung. And it's all like for those of that don't know, it's all like rap and hip hop. Yeah, rap, hip hop, R and B, soul, pop. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a really fresh score. It's like yeah. a really really different score. Um, 
But, you know, 52 songs in the show, you don't do every single one of them. Mm. But you have to learn essentially 52 different versions, well, four different versions of all of those pieces. You have to know when you're off, when you're on, where you come in from, all that sort of stuff for four different people in the show. And then sometimes in a rehearsal environment, the director or the person running the rehearsal will go, hey, can you just do that role, to, that role for this moment, then do that role for that song just because we're missing people today and I need you to cover something else. And so you're on stage going, okay, great, so I'm that person now, now I'm switching... Yeah, because you learn things generally in sequence. Yeah. So when you have to shuffle and go there, there, there now, it, it, it takes you five seconds sometimes to go, okay, that's where I'm going today. Only five seconds. Yeah. It I'm, depends. I need a whole new day for this. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, my, my, should, I tell you, should I tell you the image I have in my um, go for my it. head? Is it's the um, the London Underground mm-hmm. map yep. where it's just lines <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. That's my, I can't quite process what you're saying because my, my mind's gone to London, London Underground because whenever I looked at it, I'd be like... I. Don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> there's, like, the best way I can describe it is there's like there's triggers for things. So if I'm playing one role, I know that I talk to, I, know, I might be talking to Hamilton in one moment. And after I do that, this is what I'm talking about before when I said trust yourself, trust your body, trust your mind, is that I know I shake that person's hand and when I turn around, I know after that shake physically what my body does and that's what connects mm. these sort of like pathways in my brain to get me to where I need to be. Yeah. I also fall back, I was a, I'm a massive history nerd, so like that's one of my favourite things to study. And I remember when I was at school, a history teacher of mine told me that if I wanted to remember quotes from, from writers or from sources, I should just pinch a finger as I said the quote to myself and that would trigger the, the feeling of that, of that spot on my body being pinched or being touched would be a trigger for my memory to kick in about that quote. And I was doing modern history, and I did all the histories at school, and so I would basically just have quotes attributed to every knuckle on my fingers and they would that would be how I would get through, get exams done and things like that. I would be like, which what am I looking for today? What am I looking for? And I would find the one that I was looking for and that would be what I would write down. And I so, just used to write the answers on my... <laughs> 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 Did you not have a biro? <laughs> well, yeah. it's... The writing, down, tech, the, the writing down part was fine, but the memory, the yeah, memory part, yeah. th- it really helped me to kind of categorise what I was thinking at that time. And so sometimes I I do this little exercise where I where I take my thumbs and my fingers and I just touch my fingers. Mm. And if I just concentrate on the feeling of that, I can tune into what I need to be actually focusing on at that time. Um, and it helps me just to separate each individual part into into pieces. And then I have what I call what we call cheat sheets, which are basically like I've got my iPad backstage yeah. and I have lists of entries and exits for each role. Mm. So that if I haven't done a role in say three months, I can be like, holy shit, I need to check this now. Mm. And I can check down and I can see, you know, this character enters from stage right. And straight away it triggers the whole process. Yeah. Again. A lot yeah. of the time the physical action will trigger the the response. Yeah. yeah. So if I if I know where I'm entering from, all of a sudden I see the stage from a certain perspective and I'm like, oh great, I now I know where I am. Yeah. yeah. It's just knowing where you're coming. A lot of the time for me, honestly, it's knowing where to come in from. Yeah. And once that happens, just to go, okay, great. Throw that away. Yeah. Trust now. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned that it's a very small circuit, right? Mm-hmm. So everyone sort of knows everyone. Is it always the same faces at every sort of musical theatre, like show? That's a, look, that's a really interesting question. I mean, we, I think the world and this industry especially is currently grappling with this issue. Um for a long time in Australia, yeah, it's and I think a lot of time across the world in this industry, it's been the same face at every audition. You know who you're going to see, and that's it's kind of lovely at the same time. Well, at one in one way, Jesus, speak, um, but in another way, it's difficult because we want these industries, especially in the arts, where we talk so much about diversity and inclusion mm. and accessibility. We want there to be opportunities for everyone, and for a long time, there really haven't been. We've been a very closed circuit. There's been a, a small group of people who have access to it, and, and largely that's because. The training process for this industry is long, expensive, and if you don't start kind of around the time I started, in reality, it's very difficult to get into it. Mm. Most people have started dancing or singing or acting classes at like five or six, mm. and they've studied for a period of time, and then they've decided they wanted to do it, and then they do it. If you don't have access to that training and if you don't have the financial resources to, to do that training, it's difficult to step into it. Mm. Add to that the lack of security in this industry and a lot of people who are struggling or people who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds don't generally tend to take this as a career because there's not the same guarantee as in another career. If I put all my energy into law, there's every chance that I can have a successful career and, and lift my family and myself up in the arts. 
there's just never that guarantee. It's kind of like either gold or famine. Mm. It's it's difficult to find the middle ground. Would um would there be no, I don't want to use the word corruption, but since there's always the same people that are turning mm. up, is there bias towards those people? Or what were they? There's a lot more diversity now, you mentioned, but was there a lot more bias back then? Uh, look, diversity is growing. Mm. And, and diversity is growing because we're making a concerted effort to grow it. Does something um, like Hamilton help that process as well? 100%. Because, um, so the lead actor is a, is a, is a man of colour, whereas obviously Washington, George Washington was a white guy. So well, I mean, the whole cast, generally speaking, Hamilton is about casting a show like the streets of today look. Yes. So instead of having a whole bunch of Anglo-Saxon people, which mm. is kind of unrealistic to how Sydney streets look, how New York sure. streets look, how London street looks, yep. in fact, how global streets look yeah, these days. Everywhere. Yes, please, thank you. Um, we, the, the, the way that the casting is done is it's, it's casting how the society actually functions and actually looks. Yeah. And it's giving voices and giving opportunities to people who would not normally be looked at as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who mm. was, God damn it, at the end of the day, a slave owner. Mm. You know, he was not a person of colour. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the shows like this are really making space for that diversity actively. But I think there's there's still room for people to make make space for diversity in a more subconscious way, in a way that, like, you know, if, if something's not written for a certain ethnicity, why can't an Asian or a person of colour or a, 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 a Latinx man or, or, or woman or... Why can't we play anything mm. unless we're telling a story about a specific group of people? Mm. You know? And in that case, like, you know, you can't do Hairspray without an African-American cast because Hairspray, at the end of the day, is a musical about segregation. Mm. So it should be... It should be with people who experience that, or with people who you know, who culturally understand what that means to them. Yeah. Um, but I know to answer your question, that was a very roundabout way to get to. To answer your <laughs> question it. is, yeah. um, it's like any industry. Mm. You you the best way to grow your career and the best way to, to to move up through your career is to foster your relationships. Yeah. And so you know, I think people start off. As colleagues, they become friends. And so, yes, there is naturally, I think, there is there has been at least a tendency to lean towards, yes, a kind of interior closed community. Mm. Um, and that's, again, both a positive and a negative. I think it's unrealistic to expect that people would just completely diminish and disregard their personal relationships when they're looking for people to work with, mm. especially if that friend or, or that friend has proven their ability in a work situation. Yeah. Mm. You know, if I know you, I like you, I know you can do your job well, mate. I'm going to hire you. Yeah. Like I want to work with you. Yeah, you're fun. Yeah, and the reality is, is, again, what I said before about you know our lives being so connected to social aspects because of the times in which we work. Mm. Man, I don't want to spend a Saturday night with a guy I don't like. Yeah. Mm. Like I just don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, musicians, like when I do gigs, we, we I've, I've got a rule that I that I live by for for work when it comes to music and when it comes to performing the sort of like temporary gigs. You must have two of the three of these things. Yep. The hang must be good, the music must be good, the material must be good, or the pay must be good. So I can have a really well-paying gig with really great tunes, but a really shit hang. When you say hang, the venue? Like, no, like the people. Oh, right, like, okay. I can, I, can really, like, I can really dislike the people, and I can still do that gig, because like, the material's good, the pay is good, and yeah. I can have a really, really good vibe with the people I'm working with, a good hang. Yeah. I can have really killer tunes shit pay and yeah. be like nah it's good yeah, I'll spend yeah. my Saturday night on that yeah. but I have to have I have to have two of the three because that makes it worth my time I really like that and generally that's speaking that's the way that I decide all of my work now I'm like okay if I have two of these three things then I have every confidence mm. a lot of the times when we take work especially for theatre we don't know mm. we never know we don't necessarily know what the hang is going to be like yeah. so you're like mm, does it pay well <laughs> yes <laughs> Is the material good? Yeah. Yes. It's worth the risk. Yeah. And then sometimes you just luck out and you get a you get a three. Mm. And you get all three in a line and you're like, this is this is the life. Mm. This is great. So what had ha what had happened for you to come I've written that down by the way. I'm so <laughs> taken out. What had happened for you to come up with this model? Something obviously what was the trigger there? Something something bad had happened or not necessarily bad. You it's worked just like with a donut. <laughs> <laughs> We've all worked with donuts. We've all done that before. No, I, I, look. Sometimes I was hanging out with guys or girls doing gigs and I was like, I was sitting there going, Jesus, I don't, I don't like you at all. Yeah. And I was like, am I enjoying this job? No. Yeah. I'm really disliking this. And I was like, is this worth it? And I looked at the paycheck and I was like, 
absolute it's no it's not worth it yeah, at all yeah. and so i think it's just sort of become this thing where i'm like that those are the three things that i need in my life mm. i need i need people because i love i love people i love connecting with people it's yeah. just it's what drew me i think to this industry in the first place i have career aspirations and i have things that i want to achieve so you know at the end of the day money is always important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course and then the work itself i don't want to be doing shit mm. like i don't i have no interest in performing things that i don't feel passionate about that i don't want to deliver at the best of my ability mm. so it's just a three yeah it works what what would um in in terms of shows hamilton's obviously not going to go on forever mm -hmm. um what would you want to do next if you could have your your ideal show to do oh look my, my dream show is very very niche <laughs> it's a show called the wild party by andrew lipper um so you you'll look at me like mm, mm. um <laughs> and that's fine um, that would be my dream show, but that's probably not going to come here for, you know, it's not a very Australian show. It's not something that we kind of do here regularly. Yeah. But I honestly, I don't have, I don't have something that I want to do next. I just, my career aspiration is very simple. I want to be able to live my life comfortably doing what I love doing. Mm. That's it. I don't need, I don't really feel a need to have celebrity or kind of be, be, um, pat on the back for what I do. I just want to I want to be able to go to work and do something that I'm really passionate about and enjoy the way that I spend my time earning my living. Mm. Yeah. That's it. There's something very lovely about that as well. You know, just just want to be comfortable doing what you love. Yeah, it's personal satisfaction. It's it's, it's knowing that every day that I go to work I'm contributing something. Mm. That's all. So when you're so you're in the in the space right now of Hamilton, are mm. you still doing your other your teaching and everything? How much how much of your day-to-day -day life does it consume? Do you always have to be thinking about, you know, staying in shape or st staying in that mindset for Hamilton, or or can you do your other stuff? Your teaching and look, I can do my other stuff, but I do my other stuff much more selectively now than I did before because I'm not beholden to that to earn my living. Mm. So I I will, you know, people will reach out to me for coaching sessions or for for teaching, and I'll say, great, yes, I have the time and I have the mental capacity, and I want to do that because I respect you as a, I respect you and I I enjoy working with you again. Mm. Or I say no. I'm, I, I need to focus, be completely focused on what I'm doing currently in the show. Mm -hmm. um, One hundred percent, you need to be focused on your ability to do your job because at the end of the day, that's the person who's paying your salary right yeah. now. So part of my day always is eating right, waking up at the right times, trying to get enough sleep, getting to the gym, warming up properly, keeping yourself healthy, because at the end of the day, eight show eight shows a week is you know we are a. We're different to athletes, but we have to get on stage and perform physically mm. all that time. So if, if we're not in shape and we're not healthy, your body collapses very, very, very quickly. Mm. Um, yeah, the stamina. Yeah, and it's injury prevention before treatment. Yeah. Like I want to make sure that I, I want to try and make sure I don't get injured before having to deal with an injury and then fix that injury because that can take a lot of time. And obviously we have, to, we have to come to an acceptance that, you know, like star athletes who get injured in a football game, right? those injuries are going to come mm. because we can't do everything perfectly all the time. But if I can put my body in the absolute best position that it is to function at the highest of its ability, then when that injury does come, I'm in a position where that recovery might take me three to four weeks instead of six months. So I want to make sure that that's, that's the case, that I'm not out for a long, long, long period of time. There are parts in, um, say, musical theatre or mm -hmm. actions that you carry out that do hurt, aren't they? Or you try, or, you, or it's always injury prevention. Uh, the do hurt as in like, as in the things that you're asked to do can can yeah. be physically painful. Yeah, taxing. Well, like WWF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's the type of performance, isn't it? That's <laughs> <laughs> the honest type of performance. Fair, um, fair. You no, could like, be that. I, yeah. yeah, there there are things that are definitely physically taxing. Yeah. There is nothing that sh if you do things with the proper technique and you know how to do them and the choreographer or the people mounting the show have done the work and doing it things properly, mm. nothing should be a direct cause of injury. Okay. They shouldn't be getting you to do something that you don't know how to do properly and that isn't safe to do on stage. There is always risk. Mm. You know, if I'm dropping to the floor in any way, shape or form, yeah. if I drop to the floor in the wrong way, I can injure myself. Yeah. If I'm lifting someone in the air or if someone's lifting someone in the air or being lifted, there's every chance that that lift could go wrong. Mm. But as I said, you you prepare and you control what you can control to the absolute best of your ability yeah. so that you're preventing things before they happen as much as you possibly can. Mm. 
So spoke just before about that play is like uh, your favourite play that you would like or not play, the musical theatre that you want to mm-hmm. act out. Is is there sort of, is this just in my mind, is there like a big goal to get everyone wants to go to Broadway or what is it so, what is so fascinating about Broadway? I don't know. The Please, I'm a mechanic, so help <laughs> me out here. No, no, you can talk about mechanics if you want. Um, no, I look, I... Is there plans to go overseas and work in that strip? There's no direct plan. Mm-hmm. I'm not like, I must do that. Um, there's a lot of things that come with, with Broadway. There's a certain, there's a sense of magic mm. on Broadway that you, if you love what we love to do, it for a mechanic, imagine the difference between working on, I don't know, Joe Blow from down the road's Toyota Corolla that's from 1995 versus working on an F1. Mm. That's that's kind of the way that it can be seen. Broadway is the F one of the theater world. It's like you are with the best of the best. Yeah. But the amazing thing about the the modern theater world is that those shows that are on Broadway go all over the world. You know, Hamilton started on Broadway. We're doing exactly the same show here as they do on Broadway. Mm. It's the same piece. It's the same writing. It's the same quarry. We've had you know people from the states come and teach it to us. It. It's that show. Mm. The only difference is that I'm doing it in Sydney instead yep. of instead of on in New York, um, and I, you know, have healthcare yeah. and gun control. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Big ups, <laughs> positives. <laughs> um, but look, there's always a magic. There's something about. <laughs> <laughs> I just, point, I just yeah. point out the fact. Yeah. Um, there is something about there is something about Broadway though or about New York or about the West End or about these places that are known for theatre that is just, there's just this addiction that starts. Mm. You know, the last time I was in New York, I was there for, I was there for three months. And, you know, I would go to a, I would go to a show pretty much every other night. And then after that show or before that show or in the wee hours of the morning, I'd go to a jazz club and you'd just be like, this is, this is not our reality here. Mm. That you sounds just have, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I would go to a show, show would finish at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I'd go to a jazz bar in, in down, downtown called Smalls and they'd have like a you know, $5 cover charge. You'd go in, you'd listen to music until 4 a.m. and stumble home the next morning. And we don't, we just don't have that sort of like rolling culture here as much as I would love it to be. Mm. Um, and so there is something magic about, yeah, dreaming about maybe doing that one day, but it's not like it's something that I'm going i don't do i'm a failure it's, mm. that's never been a thought mm. it's like if it happens amazing if it doesn't yeah, it's fine you, you kind of make a good point there. i mean i mean what's your thoughts kind of post covid about you know and, and i think adriana mentioned it you know entertainment uh, hospitality have been the last people to kind of come back in the mix um we all have a lot of habit uh, you know have some some habitual behavior has formed in covid be mm. it you know streaming binge you know game online gaming mm-hmm. you know all that kind of stuff do you think that theater and and the kind of culture is enough to pull people out of that now like do you do you see the i guess the future of these industries kind of inclining or declining i think that it might take a second for them to return properly mm. but i th- look this is the thing maybe my perspective is all sorts of wrong and, and kind of misinformed but t- to me i think that people crave human connection Mm -hmm. i think that one of the reasons why things like twitch and streaming have taken off so rapidly in the last kind of 18 months is because people weren't happy to sit at home playing a video game by themselves they wanted people to play with Mm -hmm. that's why online gaming started in the first place right like it's looking for community and it was just a community that that formed out of that it's why a lot of these online forums actually started out it's because like you know i love watches Mm -hmm. the reason why watches became this massive thing online was because all of a sudden, I wasn't the only one who was like, oh, I'm obsessed with these little tiny movements and these little tiny things. I'm weird. Why am I obsessed with these things? <laughs> you go online, all of a sudden you realize there's this whole community who like it. I'm and you're like, holy shit, I'm not the only person. In fact, there are people who are way more obsessed with this shit than I am. Yeah. And you get to share information. You get to talk with people who are passionate about the same things as you. And at the end of the day, right, like that's what we want. Mm-hmm. We don't want to be isolated and sitting in, and sitting in our own space. And so while I think it might take a little bit of time for people to have the confidence again to interact the way that we did pre-COVID, I think that we're going to get back yeah. to a point where actually we're going to double down a little bit, mm. in my opinion, and people are going to want to be able to go out all the time to interact with people again, to touch again, to see mm. again, to have a drink and share in 
a community again in whatever way they choose. Mm. You know, whether that be going to the football on a Friday night, whether that be going to the theatre on a Saturday, whether that be going to a cafe in the middle of the week, there just tends to. I, I think that I can already see people wanting that connection again. So I, I don't think these industries will ever die or ever go away or ever completely change. The way that we digest them may change. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that's that's the big thing that we've learned from streaming services is that you know people will not go to the th- go to the cinema, for instance, as regularly as they would before. But that doesn't mean they're not consuming the product. It just mm. means they're consuming the product in a slightly different fashion. Yeah. So as someone who you know would love to invest and produce maybe one day, that doesn't give me any less confidence in the market. It doesn't make me go, like, I, th- I think my money might be better placed elsewhere. It makes me go, great. I just need to think smarter about the way that this industry progresses forward, about the way that we see it moving. Hmm. I like that. I like yeah. that. I mean, look, it's, it's one of the things I'm massively grateful for my, my family doing when I was growing up. We used to go to theatre a hell of a lot. You know, go see Les Mis, Phantom of the Opera, all of those ones up in up in the West End. I used to absolutely love it. It's one of the things I miss here, actually, mm. is just not having the access, to your point, you know, all, all year and the choice, because it does tend to be just a few that come here. <coughs> There's so much small theatre in Sydney. Like, Sydney's indie, thin, indie theatre scene is jumping. Like, we, some of the best work that I've seen in a long time in Australia has been done by Sydney's independent theatres. Griffin, Belvoir, The Hayes in, in Potts Point. There's so many great small theatres. The problem is, is that the access and the publicity behind those those smaller theatres is not is not as big as it should be. Mm. And so people know what's on at Sydney Theatre Company at SDC. They know what's going on at Bell Shakespeare sometimes if you're into Shakespeare. And they know what's happening at the big commercial theatres because the commercial theatres slap you over the face with their marketing. Yeah. Yeah. The other ones don't have the funding nor do they have the, per- the, the backing privately to really put it in your face. And so because of that, a lot of those shows will get seen by this small group of people who are regular audience members yep. and no one else. And while that's really lovely that we've got those small audiences, the way that this industry will grow in this country is if we see real backing and real support to get it to the people because people want it. Yeah. Some people are not going to go to the theatre if they don't have the option. You know, you might go once a year, but if you go once a year and you experience something that sh- that, that shifts your perspective on something, then that's an amazing thing. And you might go and see two things the next, three things the next, four things the next, you know? Um, or you might go and see something that's really dirt cheap, that's like a $10 ticket at the Sydney Fringe Festival when you're a student. But that might embed a love of theatre in you that means that by the time you're earning a living and a really and really comfortable by the time you're 30 or 35, you're happy to spend the $250, $300 tickets on a big show. Mm. And that's what we need in this, in, in this country right now is a real support for this small-scale work that means that you would get an audience for life instead of getting yeah. an audience for five minutes. You know, think of, think of things like products, right? Like... Mm-hmm. When I started collecting watches, I, c- I couldn't go and buy a Tudor. I couldn't buy look think about buying a Cartier or you know or anything like that. But you buy small scale vintage, and you kind of get you dabble in it. You kind of start buying two hundred fifty dollar pieces, hundred dollar pieces, and then by the time you feel like you can actually afford something, you can buy. You jump into the market, and you feel like, oh great, now I'm I'm part of this world, so I don't feel scared by it anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't feel intimidated by it anymore. And it's the same thing with live theater, provided you can make it not scary for people. And not so expensive that it's just completely isolationist and, and, and cuts off a large variety of the population. People will come. Yeah. People want it. Well, you've just educated me on like three or four different venues that I've never heard yeah. Yeah. since I've lived here. So yeah. I'll, I'll grab those names. And you can tell you love watches because you refer to them as pieces <laughs> rather than watches. <laughs> <sighs> so what's your favorite piece? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Oh, I don't it's know, a I very don't expensive... Yeah, it's a very expensive it's, hobby. It's not a good hobby as an artist. <laughs> it's a really yeah, bad yeah. hobby. Next, as an you'll be artist. saying, I also drink really expensive whiskey and wine, yeah, and yeah. I like cars too. Yeah. Oh, you do, yeah, you right? Do, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll shut up. I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Um, I like those things. Yeah. You know. they're, they're the fun things. They're the things that I, you know, I enjoy talking about because they're just so completely different to what mm. I do for a living. And mm. that's what I said before. It's just it's a way to disconnect yeah. and enjoy things that are, you know, and you know that way, like. A member of a couple of watch groups in Sydney, and we c- I can talk to people who are in law, who are in business, or in medicine, and mm. connect and learn things from those people. And then when you go to performing, you go to your actual job. You take those life experiences, you understand people a bit more, mm. which is what's so amazing about these little kind of crazy hobbies. Mm. Um, my favorite piece, long term, long story short, I've got a this. I bought this Tudor Back Bay Thirty Six last year, which I love. Mm. Lovely. And I just got a vintage Cartier Tank de Must from the nineteen eighties, which I love as well. Oh, nice. nice. My two favorites in the collections mm. currently. Very good. Yeah, very good. And I, just to go back to your point in terms of you learning mm-hmm. uh, and engaging, I can imagine it's good for people to engage and, and learn from you in terms of your life and, and your day to day. And um, 
again, almost humanizing theatre, you know, um, humanizing being an actor and a performer. Because I think when you're on stage, there is this element of there's an us and them piece, mm. which is great, but then everybody's a human. Right? Totally. So, and it's sometimes it's good to meet your heroes to go, actually, <laughs> he's, actually, he's actually just a nice guy. Have you ever done that? Have you just, have you ever met your hero and, and you've gone, oh, well, one, you're massively disappointed by actually 100%. a bit of a donut. Or you've gone, actually, he or she, just, they're really nice. How good are they? Yeah. 100%. That's happened with me driving cars as well. Yeah? yeah. Like hero cars, and then you drive me like, oh, shit. What's been, the, what's been the biggest disappointment? Can you say aloud? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Actually, I genuinely can't. <laughs> I'll tell you after. I'll tell you after. 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 <laughs> Go get Corolla. Yeah. 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 <laughs> tell me after. About, about people, though, because I remember when I used, to do, I used to run the events here, mm-hmm. which actually how him and I met, and I remember booking a DJ from overseas, meeting him, and just really not impressed by him as a as a yeah. person. Just like you are, no, no. I think that what you said about that good people to learn from me. I mean, I look. <laughs> I think we all learn from each other in a different way. Absolutely, yeah. The one thing that I will say though is that I think that a lot of people have this perspective of the arts that it's not an industry, that it's not a real industry. Mm. And a lot of times, if you you know if you meet someone out and you're like, hey, you know, what do you do? And you go, oh, you know, I'm. I'm Performer, I'm an actor. They're like, oh, so what else do you do? Mm. And you're like, mm. I mean, that's what I do. I can yeah. make you like, laugh. I do that a lot, yeah. um, and I also do it and get paid for it yeah. and earn a living for it. So it's just as much, just as valid as whatever you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's different, and we have our sacrifice. And we have the things that we do, but it's it's an industry. It's a real serious industry. Um, and so I think it's <coughs> it's important for people to talk about the arts not just as something that we're passionate about, but as a really important important part of a modern economy mm. and a modern world um you know we I, I think the statistic was something that we brought in something like there's something like 70 billion dollars in the australian economy is arts related that's a lot of money yeah a lot of money it's a, it's a big amount of money yeah. um and you know during lockdown what were people doing they were streaming mm. they were watching movies they were watching tv shows they were playing video games they're all elements of this industry um and so I think bringing perspective to that and going and showing that you know we we can really live a we can live a, pro- a proper life in this industry is really important, mm. and it's going to encourage more people to, to take the risk because if the industry is taken seriously as a whole, people see a future in it. If people see it, if the society itself sees things as a hobby, then that's what they remain, and people don't encourage you to get involved in it. Mm. So the only way we can grow it and make it more accessible and make it something that people feel free to experience and really invest in and, and enjoy is if it's a viable option for people. Make it a viable option. And we have to, in that way, talk about business. We have to treat people, talk people through the tax system. We have to talk mm. people through invoicing, through, you know, valuing your work. Yeah. Like we talk to, you know, like anyone who sets their own rates, anyone who owns a small business must, you know, set the prices for things. Yeah. And so if we have these industry standards and we talk about these things regularly, then we become a legitimate other workplace instead of feeling like we're sort of, you know, in our own little bubble, in our own little world, which we're, we're not. We're yeah. connected to everyone else. We comment on everyone's lives. That's yeah. why we're effective. Yeah. And is that is that around now in terms of that? Oh, big time. Initial help and... Ah, uh, no, the initial help. Well, I, I guess, how, like, how do you put a value on on you? Hmm. <laughs> That's, look, in, in, a, in, an, in a small business sense, in a, in, a, in a gig economy sense, when I'm invoicing, that's a very difficult thing to do at the beginning of your career. Yeah. Because you go, well, what, what makes me worth this amount of money yeah. to perform for you for this amount of time? Um, there is a certain sense of an industry standard, and that industry standard is slowly being refined and, and, and kind of becoming more and more specific. Um, so is that like a minimum wage kind of vibe? Would you fall under that minimum of, wage stuff? Not well, under, not, sorry, would, would kind of similar guidelines? Uh, no, it's slightly different. There's sort of like a minimum fee that's slowly being agreed to by the Musicians Alliance and by, you know, the entertainment union that says these are the minimum fees that you should charge as a musician for this amount of time. So if yeah. I do a gig of th- for three hours at a pub, this is the amount of money that I should be charging. Yeah. And you can check those things on the union if you, if you know to go there. Oh, yeah. yeah? But a lot of the times people will, you know, a pub will call you up as an 18-year-old when you're just starting out and be like, hey, man, I'll offer you 50 bucks. Yeah. And you're going to say yes, like, yeah. getting a chance to perform. And what you what you don't well yeah and what I you don't start realizing for free. <laughs> no right yeah. <laughs> but what you don't start realizing is you're actually undercutting an entire market you're undercutting your entire industry and all your colleagues by by agreeing yeah, to exactly. take that job for fifty dollars you're setting the market yeah. you're setting the market mm. um, acting is slightly different in that uh, MEAA the Media Arts and Equity oh, I can't remember what it's MEAA our union and Equity have agreed basically equity minimums 
So if you do a job for a commercial producer, there is a minimum fee that you must be paid for that job for performances. There is a minimum fee that you must be paid for an independent production and it's scale depending on what the abilities of that producer are. So that's a bit different. But when you're charging and quoting for yourself, you have to really learn how to do that. Mm. And like, again, in any other business, you have to learn then how to increase your prices and how to actually run a proper business instead of barely getting by doing a gig. Like, you know, we have overheads or we have things that we need to cover ourselves and we need to factor those into our pricings. Mm. Yeah, of mm. course. But we're not, I don't think that it's spoken about enough in an education perspective to really set people off on the right foot from the beginning of their career. You kind of stumble across it and you learn it as you go slowly but surely. Yeah. Um, there are still a lot of people in the industry, in, in an industry like this who don't really understand the tax system, who don't understand finances. And so they get really trapped in a bad place because they don't know, you know, I mean, look, I think the tax, I think the system overall is, is flawed and it, you know, it favors people who are very successful over people who are starting out and over people mm. who are struggling. But for me to get to that point where I want to be, we have to know the things that we can take advantage of within that system to get ourselves ahead. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's talked about enough. Mm. You know, what we can claim, what we can't claim, what we can do, what we can't do financially is not discussed openly enough. And that's why it still kind of has this feeling of being a, a hobby sometimes even when you're really quite far into your career because yeah. you haven't talked about how it's a business mm. you know? that's very true i do the same so i produce music and um i perform i'm um, dj and it's very much the same you know like in the beginning you don't even know what you don't really know what to charge for you it's that self-worth thing like what am i worth what's my time worth and it's not really <laughs> discussed about so it's always sort of seen well i know my uh craft i'm going to call it mm. um is sort of seen oh it's just a you know a hobby and it's yeah. like, no, nah, it's not, you know, like this is serious shit. We're yeah. getting booked all over the world. We've got record releases. Yeah. Like it's it's no longer a hobby now. Absolutely you know? not. Yeah. And when you rock up for a night of work, you're working. Mm. It might be fun. Mm. Like I love, I don't get me wrong, I absolutely love yeah, what okay. I do, but that does not mean that I haven't spent the last 20, 20 years of my life training to do it. And then I'm not pretty good at it. Yeah. Like, you so know. You can beat your own chest. You're good. Yeah. At it. yeah. You, can, you can fix my car. <laughs> yeah. I can't. Yeah. Exactly. There's a reason why you pay for that service. <laughs> That's right. You know, I'm not going to take my car to someone I don't trust because I want my car to function right. Mm. You know, you can pay for someone who doesn't know what they're doing performance-wise. There are so many people out there who have no idea, who do it genuinely as a hobby, who then decide one day that they want to take gigs and they don't have the experience or they don't have the training. Mm. You can get that person to your job, but I guarantee you that even though I'm charging a lot more, mm. it will be better. Oh, of course it will. Like that product will be better mm. because... I know what I'm doing. Mm. And I think that, you know, you slowly but surely work out that there are clients and there are, there are people and there are industries which respect that. And then there are people who don't, who don't mm. understand that situation whatsoever. You know, there are some, there are some people who you work for who, you know, are happy to pay a, pay a florist $15,000. But if you charge two and a half grand for a gig, they're like, oh, absolutely not. I'm like, mate, your music and your live entertainment will make a much bigger impact on your event than nice flowers. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> like, if you've got a really, really rocking band or a really, yeah. really great DJ on that dance floor at the end of the night, people can remember that yeah. over the really, really perfect rows sitting in the middle of the table. I just, they, they just will. Yeah. You're bang on. You're <laughs> they bang just on. will. You're 100% you're right. You know? And slowly but surely, as I said, you gain the confidence to be able to look at a client in the face and say that mm. and say, okay, no problem. Mm. And yeah. if they don't want to come to the party in that way, you walk away. That's fine. Mm. It's an industry. And I think that's what people need to come to terms with is the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a job. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, really serious industry. I love it. I love it. Well, mate, speaking of industries and jobs, mm. I think you've got work to do today. Yeah, double show today. Double show <laughs> today. Double show today. <laughs> What's the break like? Uh, the matinee starts at two. It'll come down at five. And then the hour call for the evening is 6.30. Mm. So an hour and a half completely off and then hour call. Yeah. Mm. Full on. Far out. Mm. Well, mate, I'm going to ask my, my question to before we wrap up. Shoot. What's one of the things that you've learned in COVID mm -hmm. that you will take forward, whether it be a ritual, whether it be you know, behavior, or what's one of the things? I think it's just to value the time that you spend with people. Cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just to value that time more. Get off something, get off your phone, get off what you're doing and actively sit and look at someone and talk to them and listen to them. And, you know, the more we do that, I think the more we're going to understand about everything, the more we can understand different opinions, different perspectives, different life situations. Mm. 
And I think we're going to become a society that doesn't judge people straight off the bat for one thing instead of look at people and see a complicated human being. I, I think I just think that's what we're missing. I think what we've missed the entire time is like I don't discrimination and, and, and anger towards another human being is not because I don't like you, it's because I don't understand you. Mm -hmm. So if I can sit and look at you in the face and see you as another human being and shake your hand or have a conversation with you, I can I can understand a lot more. Mm. And I can work out how we, I think we can, as a, as a society, move forward with a lot of these issues that are so controversial and so difficult to talk about. Just be okay with talking about them. Mm. I love that. Yeah, love I that. think the last two people that we've had on this show have been from the creative space. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I'm, I've learned so much from it. It's been fantastic. It's all, it, And the theme seems to, the, to be living in the here and now. Yeah, 100%. Which is something that I, I, I need to do a lot more of. It's really hard <laughs> though. Yeah. It, it's... <laughs> it is so much easier said than done to do that because you have to then be okay with being where you are. Hmm. And a lot of us are not okay with that. You know, we want to achieve things, we want things, but if I'm, if I'm not here and I'm not doing the thing right now, then what am I doing that for when I'm 60? Hmm. No. Hmm. I don't want to I don't, I don't have all those things and be sort of comfortable then. I want to enjoy myself right now. Hmm. You know, that's it. I just want to, I just, yeah. Looking and, and spending those time with people and, and, and not worrying all the time about where you're going mm. is infinitely more rewarding to me than always looking over my shoulder. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Um, Instagram, LinkedIn. I want, I want everything. I'm probably mostly, mostly contactable via Instagram if we're talking socials. So just yeah. Julian Qo, J U L I A N K U O uh, 27 at, uh, on Instagram. You're the 27th one. I don't know why. Look, <laughs> look it, you know, I got Instagram when it started. And I was yeah. like, yeah, it'll do. Yeah. No, I didn't think ahead. So awesome. that's right. Thank you very much for coming <laughs> on. It's been awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Pleasure. Enjoy Hamilton as well. Um, Thank you very much. Going with uh, Vanessa and Diana and my uncle to actually in a couple of weeks, in a week. Hit me up. Yeah. I mean, when you're in. Yeah, just, can't just wait. wait. You'll be there waving. Hey, <laughs> I know him. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll probably message you from backstage and be like, man, I'm sleeping tonight. So <laughs> enjoy the show. Yeah, what, what character are you today? Yeah, I know, right? In well, my mate, dressing room yeah. on a beanbag, yeah. watching TV. Yeah, <laughs> sounds That's what awesome. I do <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Thank really you appreciate very much. it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.